Yeah, I don't know if you know this about me, Mark, but I'm always camera ready. I'm always ready to go. Well, that's good because I'm already recording. Uh, well, here we are. Welcome to another episode of Mark My Bird. I'm T-Bird. I'm Mark Clavin. And Clavin, before we get into our intro and our guest today, uh, you have some pretty big life news there in Cleveland, Ohio, do you not? I mean, it's pretty big for me. I don't know if it's pretty big for our listeners. I, I got a dog this week after uh, you guys consistently saying I would probably never get one. So now I have one. I just never thought you were. I, I know that Jacka is a dog gal, but I just don't. I never knew you were a dog guy. You know, I mean, now that the podcast is taking off and uh, I, I won't have to travel as much, maybe I figured might as well get a dog. Define taking off. <laughs> uh, well, uh, you know, we always give our chili report, but I think we're uh, slowly climbing up the ranks in the Canadian sports scene. Oh, nice. okay. Yeah, I think we've cracked 200 now. So, hey, that's pretty good. What has been the biggest change in your 48 hours since becoming a dog owner? I think it's it's been 36 hours, but it feels like it's been... <laughs> maybe 127 hours. Uh, this dog has tried to saw my arm off a few times with its puppy teeth. It is, uh, for those listening, right off the bat, every question we get is, is it a rescue? No, it's not a rescue. Unless you consider uh, picking a dog up at an Amish farm and bringing it to your home and letting it watch TV as rescuing. No, it's just a dog from a farm down in about an hour and a half south of Cleveland, Ohio. And it's a mini golden retriever. It's pretty sick. And what do we got for a name? What's the dog's name? We were tossing around a lot. It's a it's a girl, so we went with May, uh, short for Padme. Uh, we're big Star Wars fans here, so okay. that's what we get. A Natalie now's Portman. The, now's the part of the episode where you call me an idiot because I admit that I've never seen any Star Wars movies. I was gonna leave that out because that's you know that's pretty know. pretty horrible. I don't know topic. how you consider yourself a human being without seeing Star Wars. I kind of think Star Wars is like a generational thing. Let me ask you this. Were your parents into Star Wars? I mean, not really. Like, they watched have it they when it came out. Yes, they have seen it. They watched it when it came out. But, you know, they're pretty up there. So they were already, they were probably in their 20s when it came out. Okay. Yeah. yeah so they've seen Maybe it. 30s? I can I can pretty confidently say that that neither of my parents have ever seen Star Wars. Like they didn't see it in theaters. I don't think they watched it at home when it came out on VHS or however movies came out back then. But yeah, I don't I, think they've seen it. So I never saw it. I'm passing all my Star Wars to my little brother. Uh, I took him to go see The Phantom Menace when it was uh, the 20th or the 25th anniversary. We we just took him to the theaters to watch it. He's He's a full Star Wars buff now, so... You know, he's he's making up for yeah. your lack of Star Wars fandom. Well, no, you're just, yeah, but you're further proving my point that it is like a generational thing that's been passed down. And we're at the point now, right, where if it was still only three, like the original trilogy, I guess, is what got people hooked. I could wa I got time for three movies, you know, but how many are we talking? Uh, 20 plus? I'm just too far behind the ball. It's daunting. I just well, don't, wanna, I don't have that kind of time. Most snowboarding movies now are less than 20 minutes, so you know you don't have to watch these full feature-length snowboard movies anymore. So you should have time to watch all of the extra series that they've added on, all of the prequel, I mean, sequel, dude, original dude. trilogy. Where you know, do you even start, though? I mean, you got Adam Driver. You have uh, Mark Hamill. You got fucking Ewan McGregor. It's like, I can't follow along with this stuff. If, if you want to get... Into the weeds, uh, you start at Wikipedia. It is a Star Wars Wikipedia that I was uh, a big fan of as a young teenager uh, when I was not snowboarding. Yeah, you look like you were a big fan of that as a young teenager. <laughs> I cut all my hair off. I no longer resemble anything from Star Wars. But All right, enough about Star Wars, Cleveland, Ohio, and dogs. We are getting into our guest today, who is the big dog. He is from Oslo, Norway. He's been a professional snowboarder probably for longer than most of our listeners have been alive. 
he was a member of the legendary Burton Smalls team back in the day. And I think he is the most likable human being on the planet. I absolutely love talking to him. I love hanging out with him. I love shooting photos of him. I love snowboarding with him. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's bring him in right now. His name is Mikkel Bang. There he there is. is. Yeah, dude, this is this is this good, is though. nice. This, this is feels smart. right, doesn't it? <laughs> Are you coming to us live in a uh, in a sauna? <laughs> yeah, the Norwegian sauna. <laughs> it has the full <laughs> kitchen behind you. Yeah. For maybe the audience that may not be familiar with you, where in the world are you? Where do you live, and where are you from? Well, you guys probably know my name by now, but I'm Mikhail Bang. I'm from Norway. Uh, I'm currently in Hemsedal. I'm from the city, Oslo, but I always was between uh, Oslo and Hemsedal. And I'm actually not going to live in Oslo anymore. I'm actually going to live in Hemsedal. Oh, no way. How? What's the distance yeah. uh, between Oslo and Hemsedal? What are we talking it is about three hours if uh, you don't hit any traffic. Okay. What's, what's the reason for the move? Uh, well, I lived in the city all my life, and I mean, I am more of a mountain person. Um, and it's come to that point in my life where, uh, yeah, it's just it's just nice to live live in the mountains, you know. And then I can, instead of living in the city and then visiting the mountains. It, it, it's nice to live in the mountains and then visit the city. Um, I remember Hemsedal. I've never been, but I just remember it from growing up looking at the magazines and seeing all of those legendary sessions that used to go down there. I mean, like the biggest jumps you've ever seen, the biggest hips you've ever seen. Did you have, did you have like a, like a courtside seat to those growing up? I did. Actually, that's... Um during those like Burton Hemsedal sessions that they had there, uh, during that time or the first time they had a photo shoot here, that's when I was actually introduced to Burton. Oh, no way. Yeah. And, and I was up here anyway, snowboarding. So I was like one of those kids. I, I was just that kid, you know, that just wanted to be there for everything. So I was <laughs> kind of clingy and, you know, just kind of stalking everyone, <laughs> trying to... Trying to see if I could uh, participate. Yeah, you went from courtside seats to being on the court very quickly then. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, luckily, the guy who actually built the jumps, uh, his name is Lars Erikson. He introduced me to the the uh, the Burton team manager at the time. And I got to hang out with them for a little bit for like a week. And then uh, he actually invited me to stay with them um, during one of those uh, photo shoots that they had. What, was this around like 2000, 2001 or? Exactly. Yeah. 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 Have you been on the, are you the longest tenured Burton team rider currently? No, actually right now the longest, uh, the longest they have is Mikey Rents. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I want to talk a little yeah. bit about that Smalls team. I was running through in the in the pre-show before we're, we were recording with uh, with Mark. I remember you, Tommy Emanuelson, Olivier Gittler, and then Luke and Jack Matroni. Am I missing anybody? Yeah, and then um, Frederick Ausbo. That's right, Freddie Ausbo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Those, those were the days we were just, we were so lucky, you know, like Burton had this little Grom team and they would just like, yeah, send us to contests and photo shoots and we would always go together and just, yeah, just snowboard and not really, we, we, we were just doing our thing. It was what awesome. Were, how did you balance? Because what age were you? Were you like 11, 12? Yeah. So when... I got picked up by Burton when I was 11, but then uh, when I was 12 years old, that's when I started traveling internationally. Okay, and how did you balance so, like school with that? Because that's not like high school; that's like middle school. <laughs> yeah, I know that that was actually pretty tricky. Um, my parents and I we had to like talk to my principal 
and then we had to like try and try and explain and luckily our principal was like very understanding and yeah basically i just had to do like homework while traveling um i can't promise <laughs> i didn't do that much homework when i was on those trips <laughs> i i was i was never a big fan of school anyway and when we were on those trips and like you're hanging out with like five of your friends and you're young and you're snowboarding it's really hard to do homework. Sure. Did, did you finish your your i don't know what the equivalent is in norway but like your high school uh, certificate? I, I did so basically back like here we do 10 years first and then we have three years and then you go to college and I did all that. The, the last three years, I went to like a sports school. It's called uh, NTG, Norwegian Top uh, Gymnasium. Hmm. Um, and that was pretty cool because that, that school actually allows you to travel if you're an athlete. I bet, um, I bet with all your travel, you still got better grades than T-Bird, who was just stationary at home. <laughs> With maybe like a slight learning <laughs> disability, uh, yes, trying to yeah for sure. And he became an editor, so you know that, that good good for you too, T Bird. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Who um oh, who awesome. are some of the other? Because there's been there have been a lot of Norwegian athletes that have come through that school. I think I did a story about that school years ago. Who were some of the other Norwegian snowboarders that were at that school at the same time as you? Oh, so many. Um, I mean. I could like like Mods Johnson, I think JP Solberg, um, myself, and then there's a bunch of bunch of good snowboarders that never really made it to um, you know, to the States or anything, but like that place created so many good snowboarders. Well, all those guys also were on the Norwegian team and everyone in the contest scene, I know you're you've been long since removed from that. But everyone always credits like yeah. all the guys say when they came on and you were there and just kind of showed like just how close a team can be because the Norwegian national team travels together and hangs out together more than any other team you really see on the contest circuit. It's pretty impressive. Funny thing though, uh, me being on me being on Burton and like being with the Burton team, I never really traveled with the Norwegian team as oh. much. And uh, that's like one of the things that I was so fortunate with Burton is that they would take like such good care of us, you know. Um, so, but for for the riders who didn't have that opportunity that I have, having like that school or uh, the national team, it's like a golden opportunity, you know, to like... Uh, get out of Norway and ride other places in the world. When did it click where you were like, Oh shit, I can do this for like a full-time job. Like this can be my career path. Yeah. Uh, I love, I, that's a fun question because I was so young. So I didn't even like, it didn't even cross my mind that it, it would be like a career path or anything, you know, cause I was just having so much fun with it and, and all I really cared about was I, I just wanted to be a really good snowboarder, you know, because I had so much passion for it. Um, but I think the whole like career and like looking at it as a job kind of started hitting me when I was around like 18 and, you know, start, you know, starting to understand things a little bit clearer. Um, then I definitely understood that like, OK, shit, you know, this is. You know, all my other friends, you know, who would have to like go and get a job or like all that stuff. Then I kind of took the snowboard path and then, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there, there's not many snowboarders that have been a pro snowboarder longer than LeBron James has been playing professional basketball and has stayed on the same team the entire time. Uh, but one thing, yeah, like Blotto, like Blotto has been photographing for Burton yeah. before, this probably since Dude. before you came on. So you've been with that photographer your entire career yeah. and he happens to also be one yeah. of the greatest photographers in snowboarding so that's got to be wild oh dude it's it's so cool um going back to what we started in the interview here is that uh uh in Hemsedal here like in 2000 uh blotto was here 
And then the year after, I would like, you can ask him about it, but I would like, like bug him, like, hey, can we wake up? And I got this like hand plant spot. <laughs> like, can we, can we take a photo together? And like, we would like wake up early in the morning for like sun, sunrise, you know, to go like do like a hand plant. And uh, it's pretty, pretty cool. <laughs> I got, I was so lucky. I got to like kind of get right in the mix with like, and dude, Blotto too, like such a good photographer. Yeah. And he's um, just good. Yeah. Good and vibe. I still, still travel with him today. Yeah. 24 know? years later. Has he, did he start kind of as like a mentor when you were young and then it's kind of like obviously transitioned into like you guys are just very close friends or just how's that relationship changed over those decades? Yeah. I mean, I was, I was so young, you know, I was just a kid. So he was in the beginning, he was kind of like, a, you know, it was more like a role model and, you know, kind of just like a hype man, you know, and giving advice when we needed that. And, you know, also when we were traveling, obviously, the photographers and the team managers, they were like our, you know, second parent. They were like our parents, yeah, sort of. That's crazy. So um, and now Blotto and I were like, you know, really close friends. Yeah. So correct me. I talked to him like two days ago. <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong, but the the world record uh, jump that Mad Janssen hit was it 187 feet from takeoff to where he landed that front I, three? Yeah, we need to do the math on that, but I know I know exact meters. Yeah, hit me, hit and me with it the was, meters. I got Google open because I'm a I'm a dumb American. I. It's no, no, no. You're not. It's so funny though because I've been going to the states for so long and I still. Like <laughs> I should know this by now too, uh, but anyway, it's um, it's forty meters from like the takeoff to where the knuckle starts going down. Okay, is that so still the record? So he, no, or is it? Is that uh, still hold the record? I have never this is seen like, anyone hit a bigger the, jump than that since that went down. That that jump was and dude, it was um. Let me. I got a notebook here. I'm gonna draw it for, for the you. record. 40 meters. Like the, the jumps they build now are very different. 40 meters. Like is this was 131.2 feet to the knuckle. Like it was one of these jumps. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It was like a step down, like f kind of flatter yeah. takeoff, step down, but super long uh, table. Yeah. So, dude, when he hit it, I don't know how far he went, but he went like way farther than 40 Did meters. Did you see that? You know? Did you see that in real life? Were you there for that session? I unfortunately wasn't there the day when he hit it, but but I went there um, a couple of days before and just had a look at the jump. And I remember getting there and I was just like, <laughs> I, it didn't make sense. You're like, why is there like, a was, takeoff in that field? <laughs> it, it, it was, it was, it, dude. Yeah, it's it's crazy. Like, are you where? where what's this thing doing here? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you, know, you put like, it in the, the wrong <laughs> spot. It needs to move like <laughs> yeah, way up. Exactly. The craziest thing about this jump, though, is that, like, how do you calculate the speed? Yeah. And basically, the in run was just this mountain. And they just, like, they just groomed it from the top of this mountain and down to that thing. And mods just pointed it from the top. How many and How many it. hits did he do on it? I think, I think he started with a front three. And then he did a uh, back one. Yeah. And then I think he wanted to do a back seven, and then he knuckled it and broke his arm. Yeah. Heavy yeah. session. I, I, pretty, pretty, pretty sure that's what it was. But nobody else wanted to to step up to that job. No. <laughs> it was ridiculous. And then, and then dude. what's what's to me is so underrated about mods is then. The next year, in, after hitting a 140-foot park jump, icy park jump, he would build this massive, yeah. like, four-story hip. And I don't know if they yeah. were, like, that was actually... measuring world records back then, but, I mean, that, when you're talking world record air on a hip, that's got to be in the conversation. Yeah, that, that hip was actually built where this jump was built. Crazy. In the same yeah. spot. Yeah. Can because it was kind of perfect. It, it just had like, and that's how Lars was so good. It was like, it was the perfect like slope, you know, for, for a jump or, you know, to, to gain speed yeah. and not too steep because you don't want it too steep because then, then you have like no clue on how fast you're yeah. going. 
Because then it just feels like you're going to land on the other side of the valley. <laughs> You could know, you fit? It's got an, it oh, could you fit the entire uh, Bang Slalom course uh, at your home mountain inside <laughs> that takeoff to landing? Yeah, for sure. No. <laughs> you're, so you're not going to yeah. bring that jump back for uh, you know the masses that are all invited to your open slalom to go hit. Just it? try and build a jump over the Bang Slalom for next there year. You go. Ooh, that'd be dope. <laughs> they obviously have the runway and takeoff <laughs> yeah. for it. Yeah. Obviously, at that time in snowboarding, the, the only way for a young Norwegian up-and-coming AM rider to kind of make it onto the global stage is through competitive snowboarding, right? Something you, you know, stepped uh-huh. away from years ago to pursue backcountry riding. But what, what was the first or what were the first few, like, big contests that you did well at? The first contest I went to was... Um, European Open. It was like Burton Contest, yep. but like the Open Open Series. The first one I went to was in 2001. And then 11. I didn't make the podium that year. But the year after, uh, in 2002, I got first place. At 12 years old? Slope style. Yeah. There we go. Now we're talking. Yeah, so that was pretty cool. And, uh, and after that, that same year, we got, we got sent to a U.S. Open. I actually got a third place at the Junior Jam. Uh, I think it was 2003, uh, the halfway. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. You, and you also, you got a gold for the U.S. Open uh, in like 2010. So you are one of the riders that basically got a gold at the largest most respected snowboarding event that there ever was, correct? Or contest wise? Uh, yeah, yeah. That I think the U.S. Open win was like that was that was definitely. I think that's one of the most memorable um, wins I had because when I came down to the riders tent, everyone was like they stood up and everyone was like it was a big tent and like everyone was like clapping. So it you know everyone like thought that I deserved it. And it's not always like that, you know, yeah. where Hong Kong. I think, <laughs> I think I was announcing that, that webcast. Oh, yeah, cool. pretty sure I was, you know, you know, that was the last year in, uh, Stratton yeah. too. Fun fact, Whoa. fun fact. Yeah. I met my wife the year before at the U S open in Stratton and now we're married and we have a seven year old cool. daughter. Oh my God. That's great. <laughs> that's Thank awesome. You. Dude, there was always. So many people that that was a good vibe. Oh man. my god, the Stratton US Open was open, the actual best. I fucking loved going to those contests every year. Yeah, you recently got married as well, correct? Congratulations! I, did. I, did. I, I saw on Instagram. Thank you. you guys- I'm like I'm half American now, guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're pretty much already fifty percent Canadian, so now you're like thirty three percent American. <laughs> 33% Squamish, British Columbia, exactly. and then the rest Norwegian. Yeah. And Tibur, tell me the, n- the Norwegian passport's the best one to have, correct? It's one of the best. The Norwegian passport is badass, for yeah. sure. I don't think there's uh, any country you cannot go to, right? Nope. Wow. There, yeah. I, I, I mean, I think yeah. so. I need does to that, maybe do some research. But I'm does sure. that mean your wife is now half Norwegian as well? Does she get Norwegian citizenship? Yeah. So, well, uh, the rules, the rule is, um, well, we got married and then we applied for something called residency. And she just got that approved, which is awesome. That means that she can stay. She needs to stay here over six months in at the in the year. Um for five years before she can become a citizen oh nice and then and then after five years you gotta it's a little bit you gotta do like a norwegian test and like stuff like that one of the questions on the test is like you have a 137 foot jump what is that in meters (laughs) (laughs) oh really (laughs) t-bird actually wanted to learn some norwegian swear words yeah that. i want to learn uh give me a norwegian swear word what's wh- how do you say fuck in norwegian fun. fun oh i think you taught me this in yeah. a lot but you say but you say like but you got to say like fee fun yeah it's f y 
and then space and then is F A E N. Fon. E Fon. That's and would that, be, would that be used like in anger when you're like, ah, oh, fuck? Would you be like, fee, fawn? Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's if you like, lose, like earlier today, I lost the garbage down the stairs. I, I said, fee, fee fawn. It that's doesn't a- sound as angry <laughs> as the American version of that. No, there's. There- you can, you gotta go like, you gotta go more mean though. Fee, fawn. <laughs> it still sounds poetic and nice. It does. It's a very beautiful language, oh. Norwegian. How do, how do you stay as shit? What's How do you that? say shit? <laughs> Bash. 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 <laughs> that's pretty dope. All right, that one's good. I like okay. that. We'll put those in the, in the memory. Uh, that's actually Mikey Renz used to love that one. Bash. Bash. Yeah, oh, the, uh, the other reason I brought up your uh, wedding was because you said you got married Braveheart style. I just wanted to clarify, what does that mean? Yeah. Oh, okay. So I'm a, I'm a huge Braveheart fan. Like I love that movie. So basically what that means is that they got married in secret. Oh, eloping. Yeah. yeah. Well, it was pretty funny cause we got married in uh, Vegas and, uh, it was nuts. Dude. I bet. Like well, well, nobody came, nobody came to the wedding. It was just me and her. But we didn't need anybody for the wedding because we had all of Vegas. Dude. Yeah, I don't <laughs> think it was a secret insane. in Vegas that night, the night you got married. <laughs> no, it was not. And then also we uh, we wore our like uh, tuxedo and dress like all day and went to the fair. And I don't think I've ever gotten that much um, attention my whole no life. No way. It was nuts. Oh, yeah, dude. It, people wouldn't leave us alone. They're like, oh, my God, you guys got what? married. And, Vegas, also, like, it's like, look at you. You're like a, a Norwegian dreamboat. You got the tattoos. You're wearing a tux. You're in Vegas. People are probably like, this dude's a fucking celebrity. Like, there's no question <laughs> that this dude's famous. I have a yeah, question for like, you. At at what age did you realize that you have a completely kick-ass name? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, that's, I guess I didn't really... That's a that's a good question. Yeah, it's insane. But thank you. Like, I, I take that as a compliment. Um, I guess you know when you're a kid, you kind of think you know. I guess I never really thought about the, like like right. that. I but. don't think you would like. It, I didn't think about how much the name Tom Monteroso sucks until I met Mickle Bang. <laughs> you know, I got I got that. You got Mark Clavin, and then Mickle Bang. It's like a it's like a movie star name. Oh, that's that's so both of your names are much sexier yeah, than mine. So. I, did, I guess I did notice that in the snowboard. I think definitely my my name definitely helped me a little bit in the snowboarding industry too, where it's just something that people remember. For you sure. know, yeah, like the but, bang is bang is pretty easy to remember. Yeah, but you you never uh, you never got contacted by that Bang Energy Drink company to uh, sign you, dude. <laughs> I was actually thinking about that's a pretty good idea. It's a yeah. great idea. Now's the time. But, it's, but then I got to get like some big fake tits and like <laughs> like a bikini or something. <laughs> Have you seen their ads? No. <laughs> oh, okay. It's like basically like Florida bikini, uh, like bikini okay, models. Okay, so we're so talking Southeast out. American market sells like fucking hotcakes. That's what we're talking. <laughs> yeah, Florida's also like yeah. basically a different country. So you'd almost have to probably get a new passport to maybe uh, work for them. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty much its own economy. <laughs> I want to I want to talk quickly oh. too about, you know, you grew up doing the contest scene cuz that's kind of what you had to do uh in order to make it on the scene. What when was the first time I guess you kind of started filming in the backcountry and then when were you like, "Oh shit, I don't want to compete anymore. Like this is what I want to do." Cuz a lot of riders want to do that, but then either their sponsors kind of don't back them through that process or they they kind of fade into oblivion in a weird way you know it's unfortunately the case when were you like i want to be a backcountry specific snowboarder i think uh, my whole career i wanted to be a backcountry rider uh because like my my favorite writers that's what what they did and then i had to compete like you said uh the cool thing was um burton organize like movie projects for us so when we were we were doing contests even at 12 years old 
we would also go on like photo shoots and film and then it would be in like movies. So um, like I would never go on like training camp or something for contests. Right. I would always just go on like filming trip and then I would go compete. Yep. And that's how I always did it. Yeah. Uh, but I guess I didn't really start going a hundred percent like backcountry until I was 19. Okay. Uh, that's the first time I went to Whistler by myself. And um, yeah, that was the year when we filmed for um, In Color with Transworld yep, Snowboarding. That's right. I, I'm pretty sure that was the year. Um, but yeah, and then, and then I just, that's when I kind of, I still competed at that time. But that's also in the, like that, those years, that's when competitive snowboarding also started to like take a new, you know, a new level, yeah. Yeah. you know, and, and, um, more coaching and more training and crazier flips. And, and that's when I kind of started leaning a little bit more towards, uh, backcountry. What was the, where I was like, what was the biggest spin you in, did in the contest? Before you uh, switchback twelve oh. was the biggest like spin. that's still pretty but... big. Did you? Uh, yeah. <laughs> did you ever go? I actually did. I actually tried. So I like I said, I never went on training camps or anything. So like, um, I have done in contests. Like tried a new trick in contests before because I <laughs> and and podiumed like, at that same podium. contest, correct? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. But. Um, one time in, uh, I went to Beijing, Aaron style in Beijing, and I tried, I tried to switch back to 14 because everyone was doing the, the double corks and I had to like, I had to step it up and I tried to switch back side 14 and landed on my ass. <laughs> uh, I, well, I like made it around, but it was like, yeah, it hurt. And then, um, and then I didn't try that again after and that was kind of like the end of where the spins were starting to get pretty crazy and i was a little bit more excited to like go try and learn more about uh you know free, free riding you know yeah yeah uh, I, I did a little re riding. i did a little research for your interview just to show you um you are quoted saying at after one contest where you like broke your arm or something you were sitting in your hospital bed and you told burton you were like hey i think i just want to film uh, now and they were like, "Yeah, we back you. Go for it." Yeah, it's true. Um, I, that was actually during because the first year of uh, the Olympics, like slope style. A lot of people wanted me to to do the Olympics, and I honestly didn't want to do the Olympics. Um, that's another subject. But get into it. We got time. Uh, yeah, we got time. Yeah, <laughs> no, it was just, you know, it was, it wasn't really, I supported the, the contests that were run by snowboarders for snowboarders, you know, kind of thing. Absolutely. And then I, I wanted to stay away from the FIS and, uh, ski organizations who just want to, you know, take over and, uh, control our sport. Um, and then also I think mostly it was because most of my friends that I used to compete with weren't really competing anymore. Yeah. And all these new kids were coming in. The tricks were getting crazy. There was coaches. I wasn't used to that. It was more like teams, you know, national teams and yeah. stuff that would go together and they would kind of just like stick together. So I kind of feel like maybe I was, I kind of felt a little bit alone a little bit, you know? Yeah where I didn't like have my whole miss anymore. It was like, I was just kind of like competing against these like national teams. For sure. Well, and, and then uh, obviously in the back of my head, it was the backcountry riding. Yeah. Uh, was it, was it yeah. harder to transition uh, from contest riding to backcountry riding or from a grateful dead fan to a deep heavy metal fan? <laughs> 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 That's hilarious. Uh, not really. <laughs> uh, 
I, I, I did used to listen to a lot of Grateful Dead. I still do every now and then, but I do listen to more heavy rock now. That's that's. Yeah, I've been I've been uh, terrified uh, when you have pulled up into a parking lot and I just hear the <laughs> loudest, God. scariest bass lines and uh, double bass pedal drums I've ever heard in my entire life. Yeah. And you're just banging your head going, yeah, you can drive anywhere with this. That's Go, good. Going back to your, I guess, non-desire to compete in the Olympics, I, I think, I guess I want people to know, as a Norwegian, like, alpine sports athlete, that's a that's a big stance to take. Like, Norwegian alpine sports athletes in Norway are, like, on par with kind of, like, NBA-level, NFL-style athletes in the States. Like, uh, it, it, mountain sports, oh, winter sports oh, yeah. are so baked into the Norwegian culture that, you know, it's not just like we have Sean White. There's multiple Sean Whites over there because they're such big fans of skiing, snowboarding, cross country, all that stuff, right? Yeah, Norway absolutely loves the Olympics. Yeah. Do you secretly they just do you it. secretly watch them though, even though you're like, I don't really support them, but I'm still going to watch some of these guys do it? I actually did. I Well, I'm definitely watching, I'm watching the snowboarding yeah. Olympics, yeah. you know. I I, uh, uh, I have so much respect for you know the tricks they do nowadays. It's it's mental. Yeah. Dude. It's crazy. It's uh, but it's definitely some. It's it's a little different than well. Obviously, it's different than from what it used to be. But um, I don't hate on it. I I think it's impressive, and I have a lot of I have a lot of respect for the for the kids nowadays and the the tricks yeah. they do is just. I always, it's, 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 I always tell people like, yes, I understand it. At times it looks a bit like gymnastics, right? It's like crazy spinning and crazy flipping, but yeah, it's, until you you've know. actually seen it in real life, you kind of can't talk shit on it because watching it on TV is, is crazy. It's impressive, but I've seen it in real life and it is like indescribably as a physical feat to do that. It's almost indescribable how fucking crazy it really is. Yeah, just dude, like go try it yourself. Totally. But also, <laughs> if you go to watch it at most like, most mountains, honestly, watching it in person, unless you have a board and access to kind of get around the whole course, it's also pretty boring. Yeah. Like there's a like slope style. Yeah. There's a lot of a lull, and you're at the bottom of the course, and you're just kind of standing in the cold. It is. It's nicer to watch on TV, I would say. Yeah, for sure. I um, I mean, the one thing that. Might might get a little bit boring. Is that you know it's when it it's so hard to understand what's going on. True. You yeah. know, yeah. Uh, I thought it used to be hard to understand what was going on, and now it's just like it's just like, did this kid just do five flips? Yeah. Like, are you kidding me? Right. <laughs> this is insane. Uh, well, and, yeah. and then, well, actually, and then you throw in like the subjective judging right and i understand there's criteria that yeah. we understand but it's kind of like me watching gymnastics like i was watching it uh because i'm a huge simone biles fan and i was rooting for simone biles in team usa and i remember when it when it wasn't simone biles when it was other competitors i would be watching it with my wife and i'd be like oh i think she killed it and then her score would come in and she was in like dead last place because i just don't understand yeah, how they're scoring i don't understand Deeper the intricacies of what makes a good gymnastics run. And then I instantly clicked over to, to being like, Oh, people probably think this about snowboarding too. Yeah. yeah. T-Bird, that's also what happens when you're just a front runner fan. Like, and you just, you know, you're a fan of like the Patriots when they're really, really good or Gabby Douglas, when she's doing very well oh, in a certain you sport. Stop it. Mickle. He's already starting with this shit. <sighs> <laughs> but no Holy just shit. i guess from my per, from That's my weird. perspective it kind of clicked with me where i'm like oh i could see people tuning into snowboarding and watching a run that we as snowboarders know is probably an eighth or ninth place run and that person might be like oh that's the clear winner because they just kind of don't understand yeah. the criteria yeah for sure and that's uh, actually while we're on it too i had a chat with somebody about uh, about this uh, the other day where it's interesting to see where this is going to take snowboarding because how is somebody or like a, a kid going to get motivated to go snowboarding if he has to go do five flips? Totally. Yeah. That's you know? when they go to your bank, you go, they go to your bank slalom and then they get stoked on snowboarding. 
exactly and we got we got it and that's why we got that's that's why it's good we have we still have you know that part snowboarding is never going to die like it right. was you know like the, the the smaller like styly tricks and bank slaloms and yeah and then you have these kids like uh now that are trying to do like different rotation flips i've been watching and i kind of feel that's cool because then it's like they do like it's like a double like nolly or like a uh, i don't know something weird and i think that's pretty rad that they're at least trying to do try and maybe get it away a little bit from the 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 quad corks and because that shit is just it's insane it's impressive yeah. it's just i got yeah, i got two over the course of your career my two questions would be What's one thing in snowboarding that stayed the same for the entire time? And then what do you think is like the biggest change that you've seen? And that could be with like your own career, like print incentives being probably big when you started to now, you know, now it's more about social media and all that stuff, but just what are, what, I guess to, for an easy question, what's the one thing in snowboarding that has stayed the same since you started? Well, for me person, well, personally, yeah. Obviously, this might be a little too easy of an answer, but it's like the thing that stayed the same for me is like my love for for snowboarding. Of course, it might be a little cheesy answer, no, but fine. but cheese it I, up, man. it's just I like love it. uh, what's yeah, that? cheese it up. Like what's... we love snowboarding. That's yeah. What it's about. No, I think just because because I've seen so many changes. Um, I really do miss the the like snowboard movie days. I miss those days so yeah, much. Me too. Like I, that was, I, I kind of feel like, like beyond metals crew, like those boys, they're, they're kind of trying, I feel like they're pretty good at like making a movie and doing a tour and like trying to hype up the season. And yeah. like, I feel like snowboarding needs that. Yes. hundred percent. It's, and you know? it's funny you mentioned this cause Last night, uh, I went to a Portland Timbers uh, soccer game, soccer match with a bunch of my buddies. But <clears throat> at the same time, Videograss was premiering uh, their movie Search Party down in Encinitas. Yeah. And my phone was, it was like FaceTime after FaceTime after FaceTime from people that were there just yeah. like saying what up and partying and drinking beers and yelling in a movie yeah. theater and hyping up their friends. Like it's such a healthy thing in our culture that. I really, really want to make like a big comeback. Dude. Uh, yeah, I agree. I, I think, I think also it, it helps to show that part of snowboarding that I'm still in love with, you yes. know, yeah. the like going out there and like trying to build, build jumps or trying to find a line that you've never ridden before or, you know, or the guys just like going in the streets or whatever. I just, I think it's so cool. Cause that's kind of, my love for that kind of snowboarding is still there and it's it has and maybe that's what i was trying to say earlier is like that side of snowboarding my love for that side of snowboarding is just i don't think it's ever going to disappear it sound, it kind of sounds to me and, like it's not just a love of snowboarding but a love of the culture like everything about it yeah for sure being being yeah. able to call up anywhere in anywhere in the world and probably have a couch to crash on and just kind of like you see friends wherever you are and just everybody's speaking the same language and everything yeah so basically what you're saying is everything has changed in snowboarding except for your love for it <laughs> <laughs> i guess i guess yeah uh yeah dude just so much has changed i mean like you know since i started traveling in 2002 you know um like it, there's been so many changes oh, yeah. we could we we could cut this if you want no worries but is there anything like in print incentive wise was that a big thing back in the day like were you making decent money off of exposure in print because you had i like remember uh when i was younger you definitely had some of the years where like on the the trans world exposure meter you yeah. were like in the top ranking person that would have coverage throughout these magazines as opposed to just like now i don't know baked into people's contracts uh riders contracts like what those incentives are yeah no yeah it's true it's that's cra crazy i almost i haven't thought about that but uh yeah i was on like i was one of the people who had most coverage oh, and for sure. uh i was like i was hungry 
Like I, I just like, I wanted to film. I wanted to like take photos as much as I could. And like, I would be like with Jeff Curtis or, or Blotto and I would like go hike, hike a thing till, you know, I would hit it. Even if I got it, I would like keep hitting it, keep hitting it until we, until we got it perfect. And, um, but yeah, to answer your question, um, that helped my financial like life so yeah, much, yeah. like the, the magazines and incentives and, um, yeah, that definitely helps. And that- like nowadays it's more, it's more, I don't know, everyone has different contracts, but now it's more like how big is your following? Uh, you can maybe earn if you, you know, say make like 10 more thousand followers in a year or, uh, yeah, it's 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 very different. And also, you're now. still one of the most covered. Sn- I think anytime anybody drops a clip of you, either on your social or anybody's stuff, your stuff is always one of the most watched clips of the winter. Oh, thanks, yeah. dude. <laughs> I also think you have. Um, it's it maybe it's either you or Zoe, but as far as natural selection tour, I think you have more podiums, podium appearances at natural selection tour than any other rider. Maybe Travis is probably in there too. Dude, year yeah, year after year, you oh, might yeah. be one of the most covered snowboarders like of all time. <laughs> I mean, that's I don't think that's uh, actually that really, wild to I say. I that was pretty cool how they used to have that though the, um, in the magazines, right? I, I remember when, like, oh, I, this- when I made it as a photographer, it was like huge for me. I think I was like number nine. It's a big deal. Yeah. And dude, and also like, how cool is that to like show to your sponsors? Is like, hey, check it out, like. Yep. <laughs> for sure. You know? I want to talk about uh, yeah. quickly the year that you won in the Tords. I mean, I was there. It was incredible. Natural Selection Tour. But the the morning after when they like flew you and Robin to some oh. like remote peak to get a kind of aerial overhead shot. Just yeah. I remember you telling me the story and it was wicked funny. <laughs> yeah, it was hilarious. We were. I mean, it was almost like, yeah, that's it. That's all, you know, <laughs> shot yeah. where... We got dropped off on this, like, I don't know, this, like, peak, like, skinny peak. And we're standing up there. And I got to tell you, it was, like, pretty sketchy, too. Like, that thing could have maybe broke. And it was the helicopter. We're, we're definitely, we were tired as hell because of, you know, yeah. we had a long night. Yeah, we night sent it the night before. It's, it, was, it was party night. We did our job. It was fun. Yeah, yeah. it was. It Are was. you telling me Natural Selection yeah. sent a helicopter to a peak with you two just for, like, an Instagram clip of just being like, all right. It was for the show. It was like they wanted it, they wanted a shot of us on top of a peak with our snowboards, and they're like doing like circular or they're like circling us and like filming us <laughs> while we're kind of just like <laughs> on top of like <laughs> we won. Meanwhile, it cuts to you two, and it's just dead quiet on top of a peak in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, we're like the conversation up there is like, <laughs> like what are we doing? <laughs> you toss your arms up now. Okay. I don't even- Yo, I don't even, I, I actually, this might be a little crazy, but I don't even think we did a run that day. I think we just, we just stood on some crazy peak and then, and then left. Well, yeah, because while you guys were doing that, I was in another helicopter getting flown, or, like I flew to like three different peaks just to film like stand-ups, like, like, like oh, segments, yeah. like true. rows to other segments and stuff like that. And I had actually, yeah. to, like two days before, dislocated my shoulder <laughs> And so if you watch the footage, like my arm was just hanging all weird because my shoulder was all fucked up. So the producer had me put my hand in my pocket. So my left arm, my left hand is just in my pocket while I'm filming the standups to like hold it in place. It was really (laughs) fucking funny. That's incredible. It's a little behind Uh, the scenes. Yeah, dude. I got to be honest though that the um, Tordrillo trip that was that was amazing holy smokes like one of the best snowboard trips i've ever been on in my life dude it's it's just that large you know it's pretty sick that they had budget to do that um but yeah i don't know just going to alaska dude it's just like every time you go there it's just as nerve-wracking and just as rewarding and yeah rewarding or, or the opposite you know could happen too but but that place is sure. there's something special about that place. For listeners Snowboard. trying to uh that they're picking where they're gonna go for their big trip maybe in the next like two years, you know, just kinda have an all out snowboarding trip. 
Uh, would you suggest they go to Alaska? Would you go to your second home of like Whistler area? Or I would even say like third home Japan because you've spent a lot of time there as well. I think I think if you want to, if you want like a hundred percent, if you want to be sure that you want to get powder, uh, I, I would say Japan. I think the I would terrain say is a little friendlier. Go to, go, to the, go to the North Island because you can like... You can stay there pretty affordable, like it's pretty affordable and you're like most likely guaranteed to ride powder. And um, I feel like and it's fun too. It's like kind of you know, mini golf like smaller lines and you can hike stuff and just play around and and the resorts too are just yeah, super fun. But definitely North Island. I mean South Island, um South Island has really, really big terrain. And if it's good there, it's obviously it's insane, but it's warmer down there. Uh, so if you go up north between January until uh, like early March, you're like pretty much guaranteed to, to get powder, yeah. you know. Sick. Huh. And then, and then, cause, cause if you go to Alaska, uh, you can go, you know, there are resorts there, but you, if you want to like, you can either, obviously you can go touring, uh, if you're into that. And if you have the budget, then you can get like client, client heli. You can go to like Alaska, go to Anchorage, go to, um, Alaska, yeah. stay there. And then if you know there is good snow or good weather coming in, you can like do a spontaneous heli. Yeah, you game. can go with like Chugach Mountain Guides. They have cats. They got helis. All yeah. sorts of stuff. And, and that's yeah, exactly. Oh, cats. That's that's almost like a better idea than heli. I think that's like more affordable. Um, obviously, bald face in Canada would be like a dream t- trip for anyone. Yeah, for sure. It's kind of like you know, it's a dream trip for anyone who loves snowboarding. Uh, but then also, dude, like Interior BC. Like if you like go to some resorts interior BC like that, that could you could get really dude, lucky there too. Like even Rebel Revel- Stoke is yeah, like Rebel, Stoke, Rebel awesome. Stoke is the real deal. That mountain is fucking awesome. And dude, you don't have to go very far to like be in the wilderness. Right. Like yeah, <laughs> I got a question. For like you, you can take the chair all the way up to the top and then just hike out a little bit to the side, and then you you're in some big terrain. Yeah, go ride the NST course. <laughs> yeah you totally could Get clipped out like Ferg. <laughs> yeah. um, i got a question for you meeks what's the longest yeah. amount of time that you've left a vehicle in the long-term parking of the vancouver international airport <laughs> i think i <laughs> i think i did like a month there once <laughs> So I guess that's not that bad. Pretty good yeah. though. Uh, I know people who I know people who have done it longer, um, but I left my car in Canada for two years <laughs> once because uh, because yeah because of COVID. Oh yeah, that's we're, right. Wait, before that, were you, where were you yeah, putting your car? Were you bringing it back to Norway? No. Yeah. So basically, like I have a work visa in the states, so everything I own has to be in the States. Um, so everything I own is registered in the States. And then I was in Canada at the time. And then we do we did a strike mission to Alaska. And while I was in Alaska, the whole world got crazy and pandemic and blah, blah, blah. So I kind of, free, I'm not going to lie, I kind of freaked out too. And I was just like, fuck. I'm going to go home in case this is like crazy, yeah. you know? Yeah. So yeah. I just flew, I left my car in Canada. <laughs> Poor Mikey Renz. He had like, <laughs> it was at his house. <laughs> uh, and then, and then, yeah, I just flew home to Norway and I was just like, Mikey, I can't, I can't come back to Canada, you know? Like, but actually it was true because you weren't supposed to go into another country that wasn't yours. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. So that's the longest I've kept my car somewhere Apart from the Vancouver airport, I did park it in Canada for two years. Is, so it's kind you, of is your relationship with Mikey the reason that you've kind of made Whistler area like your second home? Because you spend a ton of your winters out there, a ton of uh, time of your winters out there. Just like kind of you crash at his house, right? And just kind of do all that. 
Yeah, absolutely, man. Mikey is Mikey has been a huge part of my career in in BC. Like, yeah, first of all, like I I would like I would just camp around Squamish because I would kind of be I wanted to be like kind of around Mikey and those guys. And then when like all the like Wildcats guys moved out of his house, he was like, "Dude, the the door is open. You know, if you want to get in and." That was awesome. I remember the first year I was like staying at his house and it was, it, you know, now it's almost like a second home for me. You know, it's like, for sure. it'd be weird if I didn't stay there. If I, if I go back, <laughs> and, you know, or when I go, and back. I'm sure he showed you around there for a long time when you first start going out there. Yeah, for sure. He definitely helped out. Um, in the beginning when I was like learning how to snowmobile, uh, I didn't go, I, I went out with him, but I didn't go out with him as much. And then over the years, uh, learning, you know, it it takes time to learn how to snowmobile, especially up in BC. It's like, it's pretty gnarly and you gotta be, you gotta, you gotta know what you're doing when you're out there. I I went with you on my second day and you guys took me down (laughs) like some section out of Brandywine, some crazy steep it was the fastest I've ever gone on a snowmobile and I was tracking right towards <laughs> the ditch it. and it was so terrifying. <laughs> oh my God. I would scary. pay so much uh, money. I feel like everybody who's, everybody who's been on a sled or who are going to get on a sled is like going to either been through some scary scenarios or, or they're going to. For sure. Like there is no way. I would, pay, yeah. I would pay so much money Sorry. to have Clavin like mic'd up for a day no mobiling and whistler and just having a filmer like recording everything that because you're probably mark i picture you on a snowmobile wildly out of control saying some really funny shit out loud it's me on a snowmobile was like i went on a horse ride through jackson one time like with a you know with a bunch of people and the guide kept yelling at me being like hey Stop going that way. Stop going down the hill. I was like, you think I'm controlling this? Like the snowmobile <laughs> just kind of does what the hell it wants. And yeah. I'm just really holding onto the back, just going, yeah, I know everyone's just going to be laughing at me. Hopefully I make this place without uh, dying. Yeah. Oh, that's hilarious. That's you and, um, you and Mikey kind of while I was up there, I uh, noticed like you guys kind of yeah. take now a lot of your position as being the longest tenured dudes at Burton. Like you guys take a lot of the crew out, right? And kind of show them the ropes. Yeah, we do. I also, before I get in on that, I also want to tell, I also want to just uh, clarify that um, uh, Mikey has definitely been one of the guys who have like introduced me to all the zones and shown me places that, you know, I never would have gone if, if I didn't know him. So I've been like extremely lucky to, to have him as my friend and, you know, uh, you know, uh, team, you know, teammate. Yeah. He's like the, he's like so, the gatekeeper. Again, big ups to Mikey. He's, I, I definitely recognize, re- recognize the, the help I've gotten from Have him. you guys. And, and now we're doing that for, for, um, for other teams. Have you guys uh, like given we were... each other tattoos before? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> uh, we actually gave each other one in, um, when I was over here this winter, um, PLB. What's Par- parking lot beer? <laughs> parking lot beer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How many parking lot beers did you have before you did the tattoo? He actually did it like right here on my my dad's neck on the tattoo. A PLB right there is pretty. Sick. Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. How how many beers did you have uh, before you had the PLB tattoo put on you? Well, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> but. Sure was, uh, sure was a bunch, bunch of caribous. That's, uh, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, do you, are you sponsored by a tattoo shop? Blue Arms, right? Yeah. 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 Are um, we talking free? Like basically, basically like, what's are that? Are we talking free tattoos? You can just go get tattoos when you want. Yeah. I, uh, they do give me free tattoos. That's so dope. It's pretty, pretty sick. Pretty sick. It's unreal actually. But the cool, the cool thing about Blue Arms, obviously, well, they're all my friends and they own, I would say the, it, I'm, I'm a hundred percent on this. It's the coolest like tattoo shop in Oslo. And these guys are like really, really good artists. So I could, I started collecting tattoos when, um, into, well, now I was 17 when I got my first tattoo in Denver, actually. Nice. SIA. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, and then I just I said I forgot my ID, and then <laughs> and then luckily I was it just I a didn't. big was it the Coors Mountains just across your chest? No, that's what I should have gotten. Oh, yeah. No, I actually I actually just got I got my um my last name here uh, Bang here, and because uh, I thought if I was going home to my parents that um, if I had Bang, you know, it was easy one. Just, oh, you know, it's like family. And, you know, blah, 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 and... <laughs> Yeah. So that was my excuse, but nice. they, um, they didn't mind. I have a question. Maybe it's a dumb American question, That's but I need cool. to know the answer. People always say, like, I want a Viking funeral. Do Viking funerals actually happen? Like, they push him out on the boat and shoot the flame and arrows and it lights it on fire? Is that a thing? Yeah, it's a thing. And God, you know, the craziest awesome. part about this funeral is that if, uh, if you don't hit it with the arrow... Then you don't go to Valhalla. No, you need to burn. Well, right? have have you been to one? No, actually, I'm I'm just I don't know I, I'm just joking <laughs> with you. I was gonna say you also said Ragnarok, and I was like, is so is Norway a big Thor country? Is everyone fans of Marvel and Thor up there? No, so Marvel did a bunch of like movies on the northern like mythology. But basically, Ragnarok is what the Vikings used to call like the day when the world was going to go under. Oh, you know, wow. that's what they thought. So that's some that's some Viking stuff. But <laughs> but but they did but they did do those funerals back in the day. But I don't think they do them anymore. Okay. I want one. I want one. I dude, I'm right. That would be really cool. Yeah. You just got to make sure. I, I guess the the bow and arrows you get nowadays are so tech yeah. that you can't really. I miss. would just have e- Eric Jackson at my funeral. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have, I'd, it'd be like Ejax, Scotty Lego. <laughs> just get a bunch of ringers in there. Yeah, Scotty Lego. Yeah. You make sure that you get to Valhalla. Yeah. <laughs> I have I have two speed questions for you. Uh, what is the best bank slalom besides your own in the world that you've been Ooh, to? Great question. Baker. Yeah. I mean. Baker is, that's an obvious, you know, it's so cool. And then my other question is, um, wearing a, like a vest when you're on a Alaska face, does that actually make you feel safe? Does having that vest make you feel like, yeah, that feels safe. I can, I can hit this insane line. Definitely. Definitely. It definitely gives a little bit like wearing the, wearing the vest is just, it's not a hundred percent that it's going to help, but, but it definitely gives you a little bit more safety. Cause I've, dude, I've seen those backpacks. They, they like stay above the snow. It's incredible. Yeah, pretty wild. And, and then also like it blows up kind of around your head. So like, if you like tumble over some rocks or something, you know, like it could save you from potentially getting hit by rocks. Yeah. And also I'm a little bit like, I'm I'm definitely a little bit more cautious. I'm I'm still like I want to like go for it and stuff, but um, when I'm in Alaska, I'm like, this is the real deal. <laughs> like, if if something happens up here, you know, it's like it could be potentially some gnarly for stuff. Sure. Yeah. So I've 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 actually started to I like this year I wore a helmet up there too. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, do you have to wear a helmet so, in natural selection or no? Was that a rule? I don't remember. Yeah, that's yeah. a rule. Yeah, you got to wear, wear a, a bucket. When I go filming like Whistler and stuff, I don't wear a helmet all the time. But what I've started to do is, it, it, I usually just wear helmets if I'm if I need to if I'm gonna ride like a line. Just because, like, if if. Um, if, there, if I get in an avalanche or something, yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, it might be nice to have a bucket. Natural selection, you got to wear a back protector and a helmet. Yeah. And when we rode in Alaska, um, was it not this year? No, it was was the year before. Well, no, dude, I think. Anyway, you remember in, dude, he in hit, bald face. He, he like fell off some stuff and like, dude. Oh yeah, bald, bald face. face too. I was wearing one of those back protectors and just ran right into a tree yeah. and broke the tree in yeah. half. And 
like if I didn't wear that back protector, I wonder what would have happened. Cause like that was a thick, like it was like, I, I can know. guarantee you that shit would have hurt crazy. bad. Yeah. yeah. I get already hurt with the back yeah. protector. Yeah. You know? There is, there is a reason oh. for, for those rules to be in place, you know, like big shouts to Liam Griffin too, for making sure that, you know, yeah. riders stay safe in those environments. Cause there's all sorts of crazy shit. If you've ever seen, any mountain you've ever snowboarded, like, I don't care who you are, if you're a pro, if you're average Joe or Jill, it's like, if you've seen a mountain without snow on it, it's fucking terrifying. <laughs> the, what's underneath the snow. Yeah, it's, it's crazy what you snowboard yeah. on top of. So it's. Dude, you never, you never know what's underneath. Um, I also, one thing that I have started, some, some of my friends are probably going to laugh if they hear this. Cause I've been trying to like convince like a lot of my friends to start doing this. And I actually ride with, uh, knee pads. Mm -hmm. I snowmobile with them. Um, uh, yeah, that's how I started. I started using them because of snowmobiling yeah. and then I started riding with them and I was just like, dude, this is, it's, it feels so good. It keeps your knees warm and dude, if you hit your kneecap on something out there, I was doubling with Mikey Renz up this. We're just doing some fun laps early season, but I just jumped off to snowmobile and just on like, just perfect, like white snow, like no lumps, no nothing. First thing that hit when I jumped off was a rock right on my kneecap. Yeah. And, and, and I was wearing those knee pads, dude. And it saved my knee. We talking like volleyball knee pads, like soft that you slide up. Or are we talking the hard shell Ninja Turtle looking kind? It's like a mountain bike, uh, <laughs> Ninja Turtle. Would be I don't, I don't cool, mountain actually. bike, man. Ninja Turtles is the only thing I know that wears knee pads or it looks like they have knee pads. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they definitely yeah, don't have knee the, pads also. And now the more I'm thinking about it, but no, I think what you're thinking yeah. of is a Ninja Turtles actual shell on their back, but I know what you're saying, Mark. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, but I, I, I just wanted to, just wanted to, um talk about that because i think it's so like it's you should try it because it like it changes uh for for me it changed a lot like with warmth and um a feeling of like feeling safer in the backcountry and like uh even on the resort too i wear it on the resort yeah uh one thing before we sign off i do want to talk about Recently, you've been hearing some rumors about a, a Burton project you're going to be filming again this winter and then hopefully putting out the following yeah. fall. Ooh, a two years. Yeah, so we're doing, a, uh, we're doing a Burton project with Rebel, and uh, it it's, uh, it's a two-year project, which is really cool. I haven't done a two-year project in a long time. Uh, it's Ben Ferguson, Mark McMorris, Danny Davis... Uh, Zoe, Seb Powell, uh, I think Raibu is going to be in Damn, it. Damn, I love um, Raibu. That guy's awesome. Yeah, I got to make sure I'm not forgetting anyone. Yeah, here. yeah, bring up It'll be book. Burton, uh, Red Bull, and plus Bang, and you can just have a little extra. Oh, yeah, it's, I think, well, it's, I, I think, uh, well, Raibu is not on Red Bull. Oh, yeah, he's Rockstar, too, yeah. Oh, yeah, and I think, I think they were, oh, Brock, obviously, yeah. Brock Crouch. Sick. Uh, almost forgot Brock. That's dude, bad. That is a hell of a uh, roster right there, dude. He, dude, he's riding so good. I'm, I'm like watching these guys. They're down at the, um, like Red Bull, like camp down in Sas Fe right now, just yeah. ripping, just getting tricks in. Sick. Getting ready for a winter. <laughs> yeah, but what are you? Uh, it's gonna be a How are you getting ready for winter? winter? Uh. Well, now I'm going to have to start, like, I, I have to, like, work out a little bit, yeah. you know? Um, I don't usually go to the gym. I usually just do, like, exercises at home, and then I, like, hike, and then uh, skateboard. And then um, now when the winter is getting closer, it's like, snowboarding will be, like, my main uh, tool for getting stronger. And then just, like, doing core exercises and... Uh, yeah, just stuff like that on the side. Just do you have to start warming up the amount of PLBs you're having? So by time you you get over to Whistler area, you can you can match. <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> for sure. The old twelve ounce curls. I like that's how I like it. Yeah, that's exactly. How I like to exactly. Train for summertime, when winter's over, I like to really get yeah. into twelve ounce, sixteen ounce curls. Yeah. Sometimes twenty four. If I'm really looking, no, to get sure. we, I do a little bit of training like that too. That's a, that's that's for yeah, sure. You... But um, the cool thing about the cool thing about um, living up in Hempstead is that the resort is right here. So and I can like walk um, walk to the resort. Oh, wow. uh, or take a bus, and so it's like it's really easy. I you know every day I can go and ride. So and the conditions here. It's fun. Hemsedal doesn't have any sun uh, early season, so it's like really dark and icy and cold. How how much and longer till it actually opens? What what's the opening day kind of normally for that area? If we're lucky, it will open like late November. Okay, um, but it all it always usually is go. It usually is open by early December. Perfect. Wow. Well, yeah, so like basically what I'm trying to do is that I'll just stand, uh, go here and then ride every day and just kind of, um, they, we don't have any like jumps or anything, but I'm just like on my board every day, just like turning and like getting back in the groove and then, yeah. And then once the season starts, you know, hopefully I can hit some jumps so I can like repeat some of the um, tricks that we're going to do while we're out there. Perfect. We've, we've gone over time as well. So we, I will also say have a good preseason starting up and yeah, I'm sure we'll talk to you soon. Yeah. Mikkel, thank you yeah, so much dude. for your time, buddy. Uh, you're the best. We're always rooting for you. Can't wait to see what you're going to do this winter and for winters to come, man. We fucking love you. Dude, love you guys too. Thanks for having me. This was fun. All right, Perfect. buddy. We'll be in touch you're soon. Out. Yeah. Yeah. I hope to see you guys soon. Later, me. Later.